Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host, and guess who our guest is this week? You! Yeah, a while back I asked everybody to give me uh, 10 words or less their best hunting tip. You might be surprised at the answers, and uh, believe me, uh, some fun, some practical stuff, a little bit of philosophy, it's all coming up. Your tips, best bird hunting tips that you have. So looking for, so forward to that. Uh, it's really going to be fun to kind of riff on all that stuff, and I'm just going to pull them all off the Facebook page. So let's see what happens there. We've got a lot more in store for you as well as we uh, explore the uplands, uh, you know, Kind of while we're, you know, killing time waiting for the season to start. I'll give you a guide to some of the unsung walk-in country west of the Missouri River in South Dakota in our road trip. And then I asked you recently where you're going on your big trip this season. I think, again, you'll be surprised at some of the answers there. And if you haven't started planning yet... Maybe it'll um, kind of prompt you to get on the stick there, if you know what I mean. We're all made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, True Lock Choke Tubes, MidwayUSA.com, Joy Dog Food, and FindBirdHuntingSpots.com. Well, here it's all about training, but um, also planning. Well, I'm one of those guys, and you'll see how many are going to Montana this fall. One of my stops, I'll be hitting a few other states as well, but that's kind of the big trip. Uh, trying to get there in the middle of sharp tail season when it's a little cooler, but uh, the birds are still not jaded and coveyed up. So uh, stand by for more news on that. Uh, and if you feel like coming down, uh, maybe, um, you know, maybe you'll be tempted to take a look at some of the country I really like out there. Uh, also working on um, the verbal and some of the other audio cues for the command whoa. Got a new blank pistol, so hauling that out a lot. It's it's a lot less offensive to the neighbors than the shotgun. Uh, so, in my book, it's um, you know uh, the the command whoa. It's the sound of a bird flying. It's the sound of a gunshot. Those are three of the ways that I'm teaching Flick to stand still and don't move until he gets another command of one sort or another. Okay, so that's what we're doing. What are you doing? You're laying your plans as well for this season. I asked about your big trip. I know you have a lot of trips. Yeah, so do so do the rest of us. Um, so where are you going? And a little surprise, but not really. Uh, 22% of you said South Dakota is your big trip destination. Second on the list, uh, kind of nebulous, but all you rough grouse hunters are... Uh, going to the northeastern U.S. or the Great Lakes, upper Midwest, that kind of area. Uh, three, Number three on the hit parade of destinations is Montana, with 10% of you and me. <laughs> and then 8% going to North Dakota, which, by the way, you really ought to take a look at. It. If you like the Dakotas, if you like South Dakota, North Dakota's like the same. You just got to get to know it a little bit better. Uh, so... Um, you might consider that. I was going over a map last night and I saw a little tiny dot over there by Theodore Roosevelt uh, National Park, the little town of Medora. It's the gateway uh, to the national park and it's a cool little town and uh, the park itself is kind of cool. So uh, if you haven't decided yet, take a look at North Dakota as well. Lots of, lots of folks going a lot of other places, a little surprised that over 6% of you said the Southwest is where you're headed. So maybe I'll see you down there as well. I'm hoping to get down there at least as far as Southeast California. So anyway, wherever you're going, drive carefully. Don't forget your um, first aid kit. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you do. And take all the good stuff from sageandbreaker.com. Gun cleaning, gun care, transport, all of that stuff, they've got it all. Free shipping on orders of $50 and up, Sage and Breaker 
Com. This is when you start looking. I pulled one out to shoot a video and I thought, oh my God, I didn't clean that gun before I put it away. So I pulled out the gun cleaning mat from Sage and Breaker, a couple tools and their CLP. And now it's shiny and smells good and safe in the safe from corrosion and dust and all that other stuff. Sageandbreaker.com. TrueLockChokes.com is um, your resource for all your questions about chokes. If you got a gun, they got a choke for it. Just go down the list by manufacturer or do what I do quite often. I get a new gun in and, you know, sometimes it doesn't have a uh, manual. So I don't know what the little notches on the removable choke tubes mean for that particular gun because it's different when it's from Turkey, then it's from Italy, then it's from England or Spain. They've got the identif identification codes for dozens and dozens of makers. So uh, whatever gun you have, I bet they can tell you what kind of chokes are in there and how many notches each of those chokes should have for each constriction. Your resource for anything choke tubes is truelockchokes.com. Well, you know, I just thank you, by the way. Uh, thank you in advance for um, contributing to the discussion uh, on all of the social media pages. I, I still can't figure out how I'm adding 60 followers a week on Instagram. If anybody knows how that works, please drop me a note, personal message, uh, text, whatever. Because uh, while I'm flattered, I, I would love to do more of whatever it is that makes that happen. So uh, you are all helping out your fellow hunters uh, simply by making comments or having some fun there. And that's why I thought this would be a good question for you. Give me your 10 best words when it comes to bird hunting tips. Oh, and the answers, incredible incredible so I, I, I I'm, I'm going to try and break them up into three major categories the first one is who's in charge when you get to the field in other words here's some wisdom from or about our four-footed partners Christine Marie among others says the nose knows absolutely right and I'm flattered that somebody in, in that category actually uh, <laughs> repeated something I used to use on the opening of one of my TV series a while back, Follow the Hunter with the Longest Nose. But it's absolutely true. I did a little research a while back. I think it's, I think it's close to right. A dog's nose has 10,000 times as many scent receptors as we do. I guess it works both ways, you know, they can find a bird when we can't, but, the, you know, they also smell the bad stuff 10,000 times as, as strongly as we do. Um, thank goodness that they're out there doing what they do, and we'll talk more about how that works in DNA later on, I'm sure. Lance Larson, absolutely true, trust your dog, or in your case, dogs, and congratulations, you just keep uh, racking up those ribbons, and that's a good thing, too. Anybody else who is uh, not taking advantage of the off-season to do something, whether it's hunt tests and trials or, um, uh, you know, any of the things that you can do in the off-season, even bench shows, there's a lot to be said for those. And, um, you know, keep an open mind, buy yourself a sport coat or a suit, <laughs> They still require something along those lines at some of the big shows. So, um, yeah, consider those off-season activities along with all your regular training. Philip Boswell says something that a lot of others have said in one way or another. I'll just credit you for the original version of this, Philip. He says, leave your dog alone. I know what you mean by that, but just to be clear. Once that dog's paws hit the ground, I think what you're saying, Philip, is these guys are the experts. They were born to hunt. We weren't. They may not have opposable thumbs. They may not be able to pull the trigger on a shotgun. Thank goodness. 
but they do know how to find birds if we would just leave them alone. In fact, a corollary to that is, hey, if we we're hunting, you know, if you don't like my dog, why aren't we hunting with your dog? In other words, don't hack my dog. My dog doesn't need anything from you except praise and maybe a drink of water if you got some and the boss doesn't. Once you hit the ground, that dog is in charge of the hunt. Your job is to stay close and uh, shoot when he tells you to. In fact, there are only three things we need to teach a dog to do. Stand still, come back, or go out. Everybody from Delmar Smith on down has been teaching that, and it's so true. I was just thinking about that. I, I ran Flick this morning. It's already too hot to run in the afternoon, so we're running first thing crack of dawn. Ow. Um, we're walking back at the end of the, the run, uh, getting up towards the pigeon coop. And I'm thinking, you know, I really only need to expect him to stay with me. I don't need to hack him up at all. I just need to remind him now is the time to walk at heel. In other words, stay with me. And it worked. And it prompted that thought for what it's worth. Andreas Eddy says, guide the dog, but don't argue with her nose. Yeah. Um, the, the, the real trick there is how you guide your dog. And I'd love to get some more detail on that, Andres, because I think that's important in so many ways. We, you know, teacher, well, I'm a former teacher. And so we are always learning how to teach to people who are ready or not ready to learn. And the same is true for our dog. So um, how we guide a dog toward our mutual goal, putting a bird in the air, is, is really the art. David Sirdar says, be quiet. Leave the effing whistle at home. Now, I can't do that out here in the West. The country's too big. But I'm working on that. In fact, one of the things I'm working right now on is using the, what do they call it, the tone feature on my electric collar. Not the beeper, not the big noisy one, but the little one. Beep, 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 beep. I've, <laughs> I've acquired enough skill with the handheld transmitter to be able to imitate my whistle command for coming back, which is beep, beep. So I'm doing that once in a while and leaving the effing whistle at least in my pocket a little bit more often, David. And uh, we all have to deal with that in our own way, depending on where we are. But I do remember, and thanks for the reminder, some of the best hunts I've ever been on have been when the batteries on an electric collar, especially the beeper part, have gone dead. And all you hear is the dog's footfalls. Some of the little Tweety Birds. Maybe, uh, you know, something else that's just wild out there. If you find water, if it's moving, that's, that's a sound that is incredibly magical, especially out here in the desert. And then all the smells. Yeah, all your other senses magnify when you don't have to focus on that stinking beeper or even a bell sometimes or even the collar tags. That's my cue most of the time. I'm just listening for collar tags. But yes, David, I will do my best to leave the whistle in my pocket more. I'll never leave it at home, but I'll leave it in my pocket. And try that tone feature on your own collar if you want to just keep things a little bit more stealthy. Wrote a piece on stealth a while back. I think it's in Gundog Online. Maybe it hasn't come out yet, but it's all about all the ways that we, we kind of blow it when we're noisy and clumsy. And I think we'll deal with that a little bit later on. I think I saw a comment or two about related matters. So standing by on that. I'm Scott Linden, your host here at the Upland Nation podcast. You are the stars of this podcast. Everybody who's made a comment of one sort or another, helping all your fellow hunters in one way or another. North Fork Kennels of Iowa says, uh, stop talking to your dog. Yeah. Yeah, in other words, just be quiet. <laughs> yeah, we'll never trump evolution. All we can do is steer the dog towards his most perfect self. And we need to steer with a light hand. All the time. Being mindful of how a dog thinks and what a dog wants. 
Yeah, that's kind of the you know, kind of setting the stage, if you will, uh, here at the podcast on, uh, you know, what what a dog uh, what a dog can do for us and what we can do for a dog. Let's go on to some of the preseason and training stuff as well. So here, here we go. Um, Ryan R.C. Shifflett says there are two seasons, hunting season and training season. Yeah, I know a lot of you give your dog a little bit of vacation in between, and that's cool. But at some point, even the most skilled, experienced dog could use a brush up here or there. And maybe not because he doesn't do it, but because he's bored. You know, I, I came to the conclusion four or five years ago that um, we need to condition our dogs in, in two ways. One, all the physical stuff and the mechanical stuff. Whoa, here, retrieving, all those things. But then also the cerebral aspects of that. Yeah, sometimes your dog doesn't need practice on the mechanical side, but he does need a mental challenge. So Ryan, thanks for the reminder on that. Hunting season, yeah. Woohoo! And training season, yeah. Just finished another piece on uh, training during hunting season. Yeah, that'll be out uh, probably in three, four months. So watch for that as well. And I'm always reminded when we talk about training season, uh, bumper sticker on Nick Roboto's uh, pickup at the NAVDA Invitational a few years back. It said, train hard, hunt easy. Amen to that, Nick. Thanks for putting that up and reminding me. Sure appreciate it. And by the way, great job with that beautiful short hair. Todd Alley says, build their confidence. Yes. You know, we'll talk more, I'm sure, about puppyhood and... Uh, and all of that, but I, I'm reminded, thanks, Todd, uh, something Delmar Smith has said a million times over the years, never give a dog a chance to fail. Yeah, very little comes out of a massive failure, you know, a real train wreck out there in the training yard or in the field. Um, but the way to avoid that is to continually give your dog victories. They may be minor, they may be major, they may be revelations. It might just happen, and you didn't even think that it could happen. We've all had a dog do something in the field that, well, we hadn't trained for it, but it just happened naturally, and, and isn't that great? That's what, you know, DNA is all about. But beyond all that, dogs focus on feedback. They're always looking for something. Immediate gratification is their only motivation in life. That's how it works. That's what builds their confidence. So even in the field, we don't need to be mute. Maybe we don't need to yell at our dogs, but when our dogs do a good job, make sure they know it. Yeah, thanks, Todd. So true. All right, some shooting advice. <laughs> Mike Jonas uh, first. He says, don't rush the shot. It's absolutely true for a bunch of reasons. First off, you know, I did some research a while back. Most of us shoot birds. The birds we hit that fall, fall at about 20 yards, maybe a little bit further, a little bit closer, depending. But at 20, have you ever patterned your gun? At 20 yards with whatever choke tubes you use, you may be surprised at how small that pattern is. It's no wonder you can... Covey shoot, you can shoot at a flock and still miss all the birds because the space between the birds is bigger than your shot pattern at 20 yards. So that's a good reason not to rush the shot. Let them get out a little farther, you'll have more pellets scattered in a wider area. The other reason, it gives you a chance to first off get your feet set, second off focus your eyes, focus your head, Make it clean, smooth gun mount. Oh, and oh, about then, they're at 25, maybe 30 yards. Your pattern is at its best. And you might actually hit something instead of making noise. Thanks, Mike. Great advice. Larry Ward says, don't miss. Your dog deserves your best shot. 
Absolutely right. Of course, he is called a bird dog. What's his goal in life? <coughs> a bird in his mouth. So shoot the dang things. I'll never forget way back when, when I was in big trouble. I didn't know I didn't know then that I was cross dominant. I'm also colorblind, but that doesn't matter. But I was cross dominant. I went up and took a, a lesson with um the father and coach of an Olympic skeet shooter. And he had it down to a science. Man, his 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 range was all full of kind of um, Rube Goldberg style contraptions that would force you to do certain things, wheels and belts and chains and boxes and, uh, oh, and a hundred foot tower and all sorts of stuff. Anyway, Chuck Dreich, thanks, by the way, for helping me out. You taught me lead. But beyond all that, before I even got to take the lesson, I had to fill out a questionnaire. And the first question is, why do you want to shoot better? And I said what Larry Ward is espousing in his advice. To make the dogs happy. So get out, spend some of your hard-earned dollars on some target ammo and go to the range. If you got one box of shells, shoot all going away targets. Isn't that what most of them do? You got two boxes? Shoot some low birds, because that's the one we're always surprised by. And more birds fly low than you might think. Just think about the last five birds you missed. Okay, the last 105 birds I missed. Absolutely true. Probably valley quail right at brush level. Shoot low bird, low bird targets with the second box. And if you get a third box and you got the time, shoot some of those hard crossers. Just to get your gun swing dialed in and get your eyes working as a pair. Three boxes, going away, low birds, crossers. Well, my first life was as a musician and uh, I was lucky enough to go on scholarship to a conservatory of music where I learned from the experts that perfect practice is what makes perfect. You can play all day, you can play fast, you can play loud, but if you're not hitting the notes because you're too fast or too loud, none of it matters. Same holds true with shooting. Perfect practice makes perfect. Shoot 50 rounds. Go home. Yeah. John Ritchie, his preseason advice is maybe pre-season. -pre Buy from a reputable breeder. Absolutely true. Talk to your friends. See some of the other dogs that come out of that kennel. Take a good long meeting or two or phone call from this guy. Ask everybody else what they think of him. And then start looking at pedigrees. See what other dogs in his pedigree have performed well in hunt tests and in the field, of course. Talk to some former customers. The cost of the pup is the least of your concerns. So don't be shopping price alone. Think about it. Your e-collar is going to cost almost as much. GPS e-collar is going to cost almost as much as your puppy in many cases. Your shotgun, of course. All of those things plus all the money you're going to invest in putting that dog to work, buy a good pup. Even if it kind of breaks the bank in the short term. When you buy from a reputable breeder, you'll get to visit that litter often before you take home a pup. That breeder will socialize the puppies in various ways before you take it home. Ideally, that puppy doesn't go home with you until he's 10 weeks old and he spent all 10 weeks with his litter and his dam. And that great breeder will help you train the dog and will take your frantic phone calls in the middle of the night when you have a pressing question about training, behavior, or anything related to it. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. Uh, we've covered um, philosophy and preseason stuff here at the podcast. We'll get on to the hunting side of things. Yeah, I guess that was the original question. I apologize. We'll get over to that in the next half of the show. In the meanwhile, stick around. We've got a lot more to come. And just a quick reminder, 
I'll also be sharing uh, one of my personal picks in the road trip segment coming up later in the podcast, too. Where you could go in South Dakota, where most people aren't willing or able to go, and west of the Missouri River. Nice change of scenery. Or is it? You'll find out coming up after this word from Pointer Shotguns. Yeah, longtime sponsor and glad for it. Thank you, everybody at Pointer Shotguns. Andy, Rick, Mark, everybody over there doing a great job. Yeah, I think I mentioned last week a new shipment of Pointer Shotguns just in. Coming in, getting inspected, and then going right out the door to your favorite retailers. So take a look at PointerShotguns.com. Remember, they got case coloring. I just used a gun in a video that has the Cerakote finish. It's the bronze finish. You'll be seeing that very soon. They've also got nickel re nickel receivers. I guess I can't call them colored because they're nickel. And bluing of various sorts. So if you have a color preference, they've got a whole bunch of choices there. Don't forget those new side-by-sides in 12 and 20 gauge both. PointerShotguns.com is where you learn all about all the models and all the colors and where you can find a retailer. PointerShotguns.com And I just got an email from MidwayUSA.com. Yeah, you know, these guys are the best at keeping me informed about when they're shipping stuff, how it's getting there, when it should arrive. I know a lot of people are kind of spoiled by some of those really big mega online retailers. Well, Midway, MidwayUSA.com is better than them. They got that Nitro Express shipping, but on top of all of that, it's just nice to know. I'm always in the loop when it comes to delivery. And they've got a little bit of everything, especially now. They're adding bird dog training and bird dog gear every week from dummy launchers to the best boots in the country. Extremely competitive pricing. If they don't have it, well, no one does. 20,000 of their products ship free. Learn all about what they've got to offer to bird hunters and bird dog owners at MidwayUSA.com. Welcome back to the Upland Nation podcast. Scott Linden here. You are the stars this week on the podcast. Asked you for your best bird hunting tips, and I asked you to keep it concise, 10 words or less. Most of you were pretty good about that, but even the longer ones are definitely worth sharing with you, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So let's get on to the actual hunting advice that I got from all of you. And you will all get now, starting with Brad Jordan, might be the best way to start this segment of the podcast. Just get out there. Absolutely true. Uh, kind of the, the bumper sticker. You know, your worst day hunting is better than your best day at work. It's absolutely true. And we all kind of believe in that. That's why we go. We've all got our reasons for that. Dog work beautiful places, the friends we're hunting with, all, all of them put together. Yeah, I mean, stellar. But there's also some more deeply psychological reasons. And, and, you know, you just try this. See if your own empirical research doesn't agree with mine. Chart your mood the few days before a hunt, or maybe even right now, you know, as a baseline. How are you feeling right now? Okay, then think back on your last hunt. How did you feel the day after that last hunt? Okay, make the chart. It's going up, isn't it? Yeah. There is something to be said for free time of all sorts, but also quality free time in a beautiful place with a good friend and a great dog. Yeah, just get out there. Thanks, Brad. Great reminder. Brian Reynolds, uh, boy, you're going back in time for this one. Thank you, Des Young, good friend of the podcast and of me personally. Never, ever spoil your bird dog. Well, Brian, you, you must have been watching those shows in standard definition way back in the day. They're still great shows. 
but you also put on your own show. You got your Weimariner in nice soft bed. Maybe it was a Christmas present because he's laying by a Christmas tree. And then the thing I'm most jealous of, you have a great stack of firewood ready to burn that night. Maybe it's Christmas Eve. Boy, doesn't that sound good about now? Yeah. You know, I read once that dogs only work with us because we've arrested their development. In other words, you know, the wolves that first came to the prehistoric campfire, it was only the friendly slash um, open-minded, if you want to call it that, wolves that we were able to domesticate. And we domesticated them by treating them like puppies instead of adult humans, even as they aged. And you know what I'm talking about. I've talked about it before on the podcast. Even today, and even the pros like Ronnie Smith and Susanna Love still use baby talk on their adult dogs. There's a reason for that. Good things happen. So just nudge yourself a little bit toward that end of the spectrum and your dog will be spoiled rotten. Ryan Woods DeVoe um, says something that I've said for years and years, and, but he says it better than I have ever done. And that is pay close attention to your dogs and to your surroundings. Yeah. Dogs have tells. Think about it. I'll wait. When your dog is getting birdie, do you know what it looks like? Some dogs, their tail kind of goes in a circle like a helicopter. Others, it goes back and forth. Others, their nose raises into the air like they got a fish hook in their nostril and they're being pulled towards the boat. Watch for those t tells and you'll be more ready. Maybe you'll get an extra second or two or five or a few steps closer to where the bird gets up. Watch your dog. And then your surroundings. I don't want you tripping over a log on your way to flush the bird, for example. But it also opens your mind a little bit. I used to catch myself a lot um, on the show. I, I don't do it near as much on TV as I used to. But, you know, the first thing I do when I see a dog get birdie or see a, find a dog on point, I, first thing I do is turn around and not look at the dog and talk to the camera and tell everybody, isn't that cool? Look at the way that is. And, yeah, you know, tail set and blah, blah, blah. There goes the bird. Okay, I'm not doing that quite as much. I get to watch it all again and play back anyhow. So, I, you know, and you're you're not there to hear me talk. You're here to watch the dogs work. So I, I promise I won't do that near as much on TV. And then the other argument for that, and Ryan, uh, you know, I love this, and I'm, I'm glad you prompted this as well. How often do you really get out there to hunt? Whatever reason you use, how often do you get out there? While you're there, inhale it all literally and figuratively drink it all in just drink from the fire hose of hunting life enjoy the hell out of it so that the next day when you go back to work that's what you're thinking of you're going to be smiling all day and people are going to wonder what you're pulling off yeah isn't that the best part uh, ryan nelson says get a divorce hunt more I do remember early on in my bird dog, bird hunting career, one of the best performers at most of our hunt tests and field trials was a guy who ran short hairs that could, they would walk on their lips for this guy. And he was a crazy dude. He, he was a marathon runner. And he would put five dogs on the ground and jog four miles before he'd load his gun and then start hunting. And then he'd do the same on the way back. So, when I got invited to his house for a beer, I walk in and it's it's like a bachelor pad. And the only pictures on the walls are bird dog pictures. I finally figured out why he was such a great and fanatic bird hunter and dog trader. He had nobody at home to worry about. I'm not ad I'm not advising anybody else to use his strategy. But in moderation, some of those things might be worth pondering. 
Rick Horn, hope you're well. Thanks for helping out here today on the Upland Nation podcast. Your advice, bring skunk wash. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. The only time you need it is when you don't have it. And I know there's all sorts of recipes out there, and I'm sure they're good, but I have one that I, I don't have to mix up. It just sits in the back of the truck all season. It's in a bottle. It's called Nature's Miracle. Knock wood. I've never had to use it on my own dog, but I've used it on three or four other dogs. It works pretty well, and it's right there. You just shake up the bottle a little and then just pour it on. But I would also suggest that there are other things that you might want to bring along to take care of your dog besides uh, a skunk encounter. Whether it's snakes, cactus, just a torn pad. Uh, over at bird, findbirdhuntingspots.com, I've got a great list for you. Uh, it's the dog's care kit. And in it are duct tape, hemostats, some sort of an antibiotic, a bunch of other things, uh, some Benadryl for swelling. Take a look at the list and then you'll be prepared for just about everything, including spraying by a skunk. And Scott Wilchewski, I think I got it right, says also add to that list the number of the closest 24-hour veterinarian in the area you're hunting. Stuff happens. It's absolutely right. Scott says he saved his dog's life thanks to that. And Scott, I'm so glad for that. And it's absolutely true. Carl McCall says you miss every shot you don't take. And while that might be shooting advice, I think it's beyond shooting advice. When I first moved to the town I live in now, Bend, Oregon, I founded a business newspaper. And for a while there, I was the reporter, the ad sales guy, the photographer, and everything else. And the best photography I got, advice I got from other newspaper folks was, film is cheap. Yeah, this is back when you actually used film. Film is cheap, and you can't get that shot tomorrow. They're gone. Same is true with a flushing bird. Ammo is cheap at that moment because that bird is not going to get up tomorrow at your leisure at the office or the shop. What the heck? Shoot at it. You got nothing to lose except a 25 cent shotgun shell. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, I've, I've never thought about it quite that way. Gerald Rexius, great advice as well. Every time I'm in a field with my dog, it's always the best time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't argue that. In fact, um, you know, I do that annual survey and thank you if you take it. Uh, I ask why you go hunting and, and always for 12 years in a row, always the number one reason we go hunting is to watch our dogs work. Absolutely. Now, whether that's your reason or not, I'm giving you a moment here on the Upland Nation podcast to think about why you go. I'll wait. Good. I hope you're smiling. All right. Um, John Perrin says, don't move to Australia. We had our, se our quail season, most likely the final quail season, cut from 13 weeks to four. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, John. Uh, and and we have our own problems in that regard, too. Nothing as drastic as that. But it's a lesson for all of us. Um, you need to get involved. Attend some of those game commission meetings. Uh, make your feelings known. Organize. Join your local clubs. Join the national conservation groups that are advocating on our behalf. Um, some great organizations you may never have thought of. And the NRA is right up there too. But the uh, Safari Club is a good one. The Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, along with all the usual suspects. These are the ones advocating for hunters all the time. The only way that we're going to keep things or, or improve things is to get active. The last time I read it, Bob Dylan said it. He said, the world is run by the people who show up. So show up. I'll never forget one time 
I got wind of a situation here in, in Oregon. Somebody said, well, you, have you heard about this? You know, do you know it's illegal for us to train our dogs with game birds? You know, store-bought, pen-raised game birds. I can't go to the local quail supplier, buy a dozen birds, put them out, and train my dog on. It was illegal. They brought that up because they'd heard that that law might start getting to be changed. So I agitated, became the squeaky wheel, got on the committee, and I'm glad I did because it was populated by moles from the Humane Society, the Audubon Society, uh, PETA, and then a couple, three hunters. After eight weeks of battling, nose to nose, mano a mano, one time I threw a chair and walked out of the room, but we got the law fixed. Things happen when you get involved. I know politics, it's not shooting birds, it's not shooting clay targets, but it is part of our life. Here's a reason to get involved. Because they'll slip it in under the door or over the transom unless you're vigilant. Yeah, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. We don't talk a lot of politics here. Just kind of tired of that stuff anyway. And it's not as fun as all the other stuff. I'm Scott Linden, the host today. But you are the stars of the podcast. Your suggestions, your philosophies, your beliefs. Just love them. R.C. Phillips has a good one. And it's absolutely true. And now's the time. Condition your dog. When I played football, over the door in the locker room was a quote from Vince Lombardi. He said, you don't win the game on the football field, you win it in the weight room. Holds true for dog training and hunting as well. They're well-oiled machines, but we got to do the oiling. We got to make sure their muscles are conditioned, their heart. They got to be ready for warm temperatures, cold temperatures, and everything in between. So get your dog physically fit. Oh, and by the way, another great, great quote. I don't know who said this first, but I've stolen it. You may steal it from me. If your dog's fat, you're not getting enough exercise. Don't look at your waist. <laughs> Just get out and do something about it. Chris Lee Hamby says, always trust my GWP nose and take the kids. Yeah, if for no other reason that at some point you're not going to be allowed to drive anymore, but you want to go hunting, maybe they'll take you. Especially if you have a great relationship that is built around, say, dog training. Great way to get kids involved in the outdoors. It's right out the back door for you. In the yard, they can learn all that stuff. They can be your assistant. They can become a great apprentice hunter. Just get them used to all the kind of the you parts of, uh, you know, hunting early on. That's where food comes from. Noises bring food. Gunfire, you know what I mean. Train your kids like you'd train your dog. Just don't ever put that e-collar on them. Randall Stetzer Randall, do you go by Randy elsewhere in our world, maybe in the fly fishing world? Anyway, great advice. Um, I'll never forget Ben Warner's version of this. Thank you, Sergeant Ben. Keep walking. <laughs> yeah, how are you going to find birds? They're not going to come to you. They never do, never will, never have. Okay, maybe once or twice. We all have that story. We're at the truck. In fact, I'm going to talk about that story later. But anyway, Ben and Randall have the same basic philosophy. And oh, I showed Ben a spot once on a, on a big desert river out in the middle of nowhere. And he went out and he had such a great time. He said, I, I'm taking you next weekend. I said, okay, let's go. So we drove farther and deeper, got out of the truck, put his old girl and my young boy Flick on the ground. Bernie and Flick, by the end of the day, had put in 31 miles each. 
but we'd both just about limited out. Not that we care about that, but, you know, we, we started, you know, Ben likes tailgate photos. I went along with him and I realized, my God, we shot a lot of birds. Quail, chuckers, valley quail, chuckers. It was incredible. And the lesson in all of that, Randall, is if you're just willing to work a little bit harder than everybody else, then all of a sudden, birds happen. That's especially true on that, you know, the really popular walk-in ground, but it's true almost everywhere. Tina Lawrence, oh yeah, yeah, this is a corollary to a few other people. Keep your mouth shut. Let the dog work. Absolutely true. In fact, I just finished a video for um, Midway USA on uh, my face for radio. Yeah, be grateful this is not television. Um, thanks, Phil Swain. Great trainer, NABDA judge, fantastic hunter for that advice. The brightness of your face is what a dog is looking for for guidance, particularly when it comes to where he should be. He wants to be out front so he can see your face. So zip your lips, make sure you can see your face, look where you want the dog to go, and you might just get a little bit better performance out of your dog. Tim Wright summed it up, among others. So did Greg Vinson and Pat McCall. Have fun. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of other things that are a lot easier to do. You better enjoy yourself. I took another lesson from another great guy who uh, ended up um, writing a book on the subject. Uh, but uh, Buzz Fawcett uh, originally taught me one great thing. I broke, broke a target at 60 yards in my lesson with him. And man, I was over the moon. And he said, you know why? You know why you're so excited about that? And I said, why? He said, well, back in the day when we could throw a rock at a pterodactyl and knock it down, we knew we'd be eating. Yeah, whatever it is, it is fun. And that's as good an answer as any I've ever heard. So thanks, Buzz. Thanks, Tim, Greg, Pat, for all of that. Um, you know what I'm trying to do. And Pat, you said enjoy the moment. And it's, it's, it's so true. Every single moment, not just the whole trip. What happened just now? It could be anything. It could be those sage grouse that got up behind you that you weren't even expecting. It could be the view from the top of that hill. It could be that smell of cut corn. And by the way, next time you're in a bunch of cut corn, pick up one of the leftover ears and just take one kernel and chew on it. I know, it. don't break your dentures, but chew on it. It is the taste of pheasant hunting. And that's why I celebrate at the end of every hunt. There's always somebody to salute. The dogs, your partner, partner's long gone, it doesn't matter. The place you are. Yeah, I keep all the ingredients for a celebration in the back of the truck. When the dogs are watered and put up, everybody's checked everybody for torn pads and stuff in their eyes. We crack a bottle and we have one drink on the tailgate. You can drink whatever you want. It's not the ingredients in the glass. It's the stuff that goes along with it. We're going to go a step further. Maybe you want to do this too. I'll, I'll have a full report when we get closer to it. We used to do a thing called the shot and caught dinner where everybody I knew who fished or hunted would purge their freezer in February or March and, and cook something up and bring it to the party. Man, did we have some good stuff. And we ultimately extended it to allow the foragers in the crowd to join us as well. And that got us some, uh, some wild blackberries and some mushroom soup that were just to, to die for. Uh, shot and caught potluck is a great way to extend the magic of that last hunt into the spring. Go ahead. I I encourage you to steal that idea as well. Uh, John Reynolds says, uh, hunting with a best friend, friend from high school. Absolutely. Mine's from music school. Doesn't matter. You all say fellowship, hunting with people you like, friends and family, top priority. I get it. There is 
Yeah, I wrote a piece on hunting by yourself, and I, I still love to do that a lot, but I also like hunting with people I like. Diana Wise says, look where your dog is looking. Yeah, and vice versa. Remember John and Jessica Han from uh, Perfection Kennels? I think Jessica said, where the dog's eyes are looking, that's the way he's going to go. So the first thing you do maybe is wait until he's looking where you want him to go, then give him the command. And here's one that I, I totally forgot about this. Thanks, Diana, for the, for the reminder. You got two dogs and you can't find one? I'll bet your other dog is looking right at him. Now, he may not be able to see him, but he probably smells him or he hears him. So if you're looking for that second dog, watch the first dog. Dan McMahon says something that um, we, we always learn the hard way. Pheasants need a flusher and blockers if you want to shoot birds. Pointers are great at pointing where the birds were. Yeah, uh, boy, you know, if I lived in South Dakota, I'd own big labs and maybe some little cockers. Bob Mann says, for pheasants, use blockers. Yeah, absolutely true. But I've worked on a couple of things. In fact, I'm, I might write a piece on this sometime. <clears throat> some of the kind of the dirty tricks we can play on the birds that will help us be more like a block and drive hunt, even if we can't spare the personnel. You know, for one example, uh, in fact, I hope to get back there because now Ramsey and Julie are running the operation up there. So if you're listening, Ramsey, I'm ready for an invitation. Um, and Julie, you too, you can't wait. Um, we were hunting Milo, you know, the knee high to waist high Milo field. And the dogs were constantly frustrated. Great young short hairs, but they were constantly frustrated going up those rows, having the birds stop. They'd point the birds. Birds would run on. Stop, point, stop, point. So I said, to hell with this. I got outside the field and I ran carefully with an open gun, ran alongside the field, got 25, 30 yards ahead of everybody, including the birds. And for about... 90 seconds, I was a blocker. Yeah, you got to be a little careful, not just running up there, but also a direction that everybody shoots. But it worked. And it worked again and again. Yeah, you can see that in, I think it's the second episode of Wing Shooting USA from Horseshoe Curve. Okay, yeah, lessons of all sorts. Miles Burdett says, slow down, trust the dog. Adam Larson and Nick Seabald both say pretty much the same thing. Be ready to shoot when your dog hits the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so make that the last thing you do. Get everything else ready, then open the box and send the dog out. Learned that the hard way in Kansas. We were doing a show and we were working with the guys who had basically honchoed the entire walk-in program in Kansas, which is world-class, by the way. So Wes and I were chewing the fat while the dogs were running around. We thought they were just peeing on tires and getting loose. No, somebody said, hey, look at that. Flicks on point on a, uh, a thicket of um, whatever they grow out there. Wild plums, I think. You know, so the, here's one of those thickets between two fields. He's already there and he slammed into a point and we're sitting around talking to each other. We finally found that bird. We chased that bird probably two flushes and then a shot that finally winged him. Flick had to dig under a fallen log to bring that dog, that bird back. But he did it and boy, am I glad because he worked. He had his mind on business while we had our mind on chewing the fat. Which is also good. Just leave the dog in the box while you're chewing. William Reader says the dog is never wrong, assuming it's a... You can insert your own breed here. And the same holds true for puppies. Ronnie Smith said it most recently to me. Puppies can't do anything wrong, so don't hold it against them. Yeah. Mike Mello says for chuckers, train yourself, get in tip-top shape. Boy, I haven't heard that phrase for a while. Tip Top. That's the name of Aaron Tippins Management Company. Well, I'm doing my best, Mike, and I'm sure everybody else is too. Um, here's one that seems to be very popular whenever I bring this up around a campfire. 
at the end of the day, in the middle of the night, it's always the middle of the night, when the leg cramps hit, well, in a lot of ways, it's too late. Plan ahead. During the hunt, half of the water that you drink, put these little tablets called Noon, N-U-U-N, in there, full of electrolytes, kind of like the old-time plop, plop, fizz, fizz, Alka-Seltzer. You throw them in, they bubble up, you drink it. At the end of the day, potassium tablets, magnesium tablets. If you get a cramp in the middle of the night, hopefully uh, next to your sleeping bag, you've got some of those Highlands leg cramp pills. They're just more magnesium. Or the new one that I'm really liking these days, worth every penny, and it's a pretty penny. Hot shot. It's a liquid in a little bottle. Hot shot. It's got some sort of a hot pepper in it, among other things. It doesn't taste bad, but it doesn't taste good. And it's not going to give you that burn that you get from uh, from serious Mexican food. Hot shot. It's got just enough pepper in it. The moment you swallow it, cramps are gone. It's a psycho psychosocial physiological reaction that your muscles have to that capsaicin in the pepper. Hot shot liquid. All right. Deutsch Drahtar Zwinger von Makosh, Makoshika. Yeah, Makoshika. Suggests that um, one of the things you ought to do is buy the best boots you can afford. Amen to that. I'll call you Zwinger. And break them in well. Yeah. And by the way, I like 10 inch height or higher. There's always that stream. You know, like when you're fishing, you wear hip boots and the stream is an inch deeper than the hip boots are high. It's the same with boots in a bird hunt. You want to cross that stream. I just wear high boots. Most of the time it works. And Scott Breitsprecher, boy, working on my German here for a while. Scott Breitsprecher says, good friends, smooth scotch, lots of birds, great dog work. Yeah, once in a while, I'll go with a serious eyelay scotch, which is the opposite of smooth. They're pretty proud of their peat over there, Scott. But other than that, I cannot, I cannot argue any bit of that. All of those things together are the things we think about on Monday morning. And I hope you think about them too. That was the whole goal of asking you all for help. And you came through. You passed with flying colors. Thank you all for that. We've got a little bit more to talk about, including that road trip to an unsung corner of South Dakota in just a moment. Yeah, we're brought to you in part by Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School. This time of year, take a lesson. Yeah, yeah so many people suggested that. There's a reason. You're in Western Oregon, take the RV, stay a while, shoot all the games. It's kind of fun to get up in the morning, shoot first thing, shoot last thing, watch the sun go down. If you're closer to Jervis, Oregon and Mid-Valley Clays and Shooting School, don't forget After Hours Wednesday. Just call ahead and they'll leave the lights on for you. Learn more about all of their shooting games, their lessons, and some news coming very soon, as well as their pro shop. Go to midvalleyclays.com. And if you're looking to switch, and 75% of you said you might, if you're looking to switch dog food, take a look at Joy Dog Food. Joydogfood.com is where you can learn more about their formulations. Take a look at the guaranteed analysis. They've got some great performance formulas out there for you. And this company knows of what they speak. They've been around for 75 years, family-owned and operated, 100% American-made, American ingredients. Fixed formulas. They're not changing up the protein source or the carbohydrate source. Fixed formulas for consistency. You know that manifests itself in many ways, often in how much you have to clean up, if you know what I mean. Learn more. Put some joy in your dog. Yeah, Joy Dog Food. JoyDogFood.com. Well, 
The prairies west of the Missouri River are dominated by the cows, the Indian reservations, and the billboards for wall drug. But as you get closer to the Missouri River, your hunting prospects improve. South Dakota is full of birds, by the way. But sometimes we neglect what a lot of people call West River. Along the river north of Pier, the city of Pier, is Lake Oahe. Giant lake reservoir on the Missouri. Now on the west side, if you can squeeze between the Cheyenne Indian Reservation and the Missouri River, you'll find a little slice here and a little slice there of Corps of Engineers land. The funny thing is, it looks just like the stuff on the east side of the river and all the way to the border. Breaks roll down to the river, draws bisect the river's course, and there's grass, and that means there's pheasants and sharptails. Might require a little bit more work, a little bit more creativity, maybe four-wheel drive in a couple spots, but it would be worth the effort because no one else goes there. Except me. Maybe I'll see you there this fall. Thanks so much. You all make this podcast possible. And literally this time around, your comments were the podcast. I appreciate that. Even if I didn't get around to you, everybody else is reading that Facebook post right about now. So uh, thank you for your contributions especially those who left ratings and reviews at their podcast platform. That's how we grow. We're made possible by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products, Pointer Shotguns, Joy Dog Food, MidValleyClays.com, and TrueLockChokes.com. If you're looking for more tips and advice or that new e-booklet on finding public access, yeah, just put that together at findbirdhuntingspots.com. Just go there. The pop-up will direct you to where you can take a look at that. It's all right there, and I am so grateful for your support of all sorts, including those of you who have bought that or the webinar or the list of public access providers. Thanks so much for listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. See you down the road.